Good morning, First Baptist Church family, and welcome to this time of spiritual reflection as we continue to walk through this uh, short book of Amos. We're in chapter 6 today. I am coming on about an hour early because of a scheduling conflict at 10.30 for me, uh, so I assume that most of you will uh, not be aware of this, and you'll be hopping on at 10.30 rather than now. But that's okay. Uh, feel free to continue to, to leave your comments, even if you are not able to get on until 10.30. Uh, please leave any prayer request or just say hello. I would love to be able to communicate with you, and I could always respond later in the comments section below. Uh, but uh, due to this conflict, we will start now instead of 10.30. Next week, next Tuesday, we'll be back on our normal time at 10.30. I am uh, recording this from my house, and so there are animals, there are boys, and um, so there's no telling what you might see this morning. Amos chapter 6, I will be reading from the message version, and I encourage you every week, if you have the Bible app, to download the message version. That's Eugene Peterson's version of the Bible. It's a wonderful version uh, that uh, is uh, easy to read, and it reads like a story. So if you would, uh, download that so we could be reading the same translation. Janie Berry says, good Tuesday morning. Good morning to you also, Miss Janie Berry. Amos chapter 6. Woe to you who think you live on easy street in Zion, who think Mount Samaria is the good life, you assume you're at the top of the heap, voted the number one place to live. Well, wake up and look around. Get off your pedestal. Take a look at Calne. Go and visit Great Hamath. Look in on Gath of the Philistines. Doesn't that take you off your high horse? Compared to them, you're not much, are you? Woe to you who are rushing headlong to disaster. Catastrophe is just around the corner. Woe to those who live in luxury, expect everyone else to serve them. Woe to those who live only for today, indifferent for the fate of others. Woe to the playboys and the playgirls who think life is a party held just for them. Woe to those addicted to feeling good without pain. Those obsessed with looking good, life without wrinkles. They could not care less about their country going to ruin. But here's what's really coming. A forced march into exile. They'll leave the country whining. A ragtag bunch of good-for-nothings. God the Master has sworn and solemnly stands by his word. The God of the angel army speaks. I hate the arrogance of Jacob. I have nothing but contempt for his forts. I'm about to hand over the city and everyone in it. Ten men are in the house, all dead. A relative comes and gets the bodies to prepare them for a decent burial. He discovers a survivor huddled in the closet and asks, Are there any more? The answer, not a soul. But hush, God must not be mentioned in this desecrated place. Note well, God issues the orders. He'll knock down large houses to smithereens. He'll smash little houses to bits. Do you hold a racehorse in a field of rocks? You plow the sea with oxen, you'd cripple the horses, you'd drown the oxen, and yet you'd made, you'd made shambles of justice, a bloated corpse of righteousness, bragging of your trivial pursuits, beating up on the weak and crowing, look what I have done. Enjoy it while you can, Israelites. I've got a pagan army on the move against you. This is your God speaking, God of the angel armies, and they'll make hash of you from one end of the country to other. Well, I hope that uh, you are not watching uh, this uh, video and are already in a state of deep depression because this uh, chapter, as the previous chapters, uh, could only make you more depressed. When I read this text, I can just smell the arrogance. Can't you smell that? I mean, the people of God in the north remember that uh, Amos is from the southern kingdom. He's from Judah. He goes up north to the northern kingdom of Israel, and he sp speaks this harsh word of judgment. And it's all due to their arrogance. You could just smell the arrogance in the text, the way they live, how they live, 
They live in these big, beautiful homes. They, they live in luxury, and yet their fellow brothers and sisters who are surrounding them live in poverty. It's physical poverty, spiritual poverty. They do nothing to lend them a hand. And so Amos speaks this word of judgment. He says this at the beginning. You were voted the number one place to live. Get off your pedestal. Get off your high horse. See, it's arrogance. It's a theme that we, uh, it's a strand that runs throughout this entire prophecy is the people of God have this inflated view of themselves. And they're more concerned about them than others. Uh, and you thought that egocentrism uh, was just a 21st century phenomenon. <laughs> it's not. It's been around forever. The people of God, it's all about them and not about anybody else. So he says, disaster's coming as he's been preaching throughout this book to the folks in the north. Woe to you live in luxury. Woe to the playboys and playgirls. Woe to those who are addicted to feeling good, who are obsessed with looking good. Woe to those who are superficial, is what he's saying is. There's no depth. They're just theologically and spiritually hollow. And then God speaks in verse 8. I hate the arrogance of Jacob. I have nothing but contempt for his forts. I'm about to hand over the city and everyone in it. God says... I am handing you over to the enemies. Now, this is typically not the view of God that we're given in Scripture. If you look at the whole narrative of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, uh, God is seen as this protector. God is this mother hen who protects um, her chicks. And the wings protect us from those who would harm us. The wings of the hen but that is not the picture that we're given here in Amos 6. It's not of this mother hen who protects her chicks. It's being handed over to the enemies. And there is a reason for that. It's not God does this just because this is what God is longing to do. I don't think God wants to do this at all. God says, I've tried to grab your attention. I've tried to teach you. I've sent people like Amos to pronounce judgment and to tell you to turn from your ways, and yet nothing seemed to change. God doesn't seem to be able to get their attention. And so that's why I'm handing you over. This is certainly a hard text to read, and most of Amos has been hard to read because I think, uh, I think that we, in a way, can find ourselves in this text. Um, because I think we're, we could be spiritually hollow. Uh, we can have an inflated view of self. We could be more concerned with ourselves than those around us. And so this is a pertinent word for today because it still speaks to us as modern 21st century Western Christians. That all of these things that the people of God in the North are struggling with in the 8th century BCE, we too struggle with. I wonder the ways in which God over the years has been trying to get our attention and we, we tune God out. Maybe God is trying to get our attention now. Maybe God is trying to get our attention as a church. Are we tuning God out or are we lending God an ear? I think this just goes to show how important it is to listen to God because God is speaking to us. God has something to say. God has not stopped speaking. Um, so what is God saying? Is that a harsh word? It could be. And if it is the harsh word, are we going to abide by it? These are all things to think about as we continue to look through these minor prophets. Is um, They're harsh words of judgment. And, and yet, in a way, they're applicable to us today question is, are we listening? Thank you folks for joining me for this time of spiritual reflection. I'll see you next Tuesday morning at 1030.